Okay. We should talk about the poet, Emily Dickinson. My guess is that you all at some point have heard of Emily Dickinson. You probably heard that she was a crazy lady who stayed indoors during her whole life and wrote poems in her bedroom upstairs. Well, some of that's true. The thing is, Dickinson had a problem with her eyesight. She was very sensitive to bright light. So she did tend to stay indoors a lot. She wasn't really uh, you know, a crazy at home, agoraphobic lady though. She had friends and she was very close with her sister Lavinia, especially after their parents died and they shared that big house in Amherst, Massachusetts together. Both sisters were also very close with their brother Austin who lived next door with his wife, Susan. And Emily did have boyfriends and suitors that we know of. She wrote some very steamy letters to a banker gentleman who had proposed marriage to her. So she got out and she certainly knew the world. Mostly though, uh, in order to understand the world, she read deeply. She seems to have read everything from the magazines of her day and she was deeply read in the literature of her day as well. Having that ability to read about the world while you're sitting in your house, um, well, for, for Dickinson, it made her very well informed about American politics, American culture, American literature. She took it all in from different sources, and she had a lot to say in response to what she learned. So we read her poetry because in her verse, we see a lady who was very astute as a critic of American society. For example, in the short poem, uh, faith is a fine invention for gentlemen who see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. She wrote this short poem sometime after Charles Darwin, Darwin had published his book on the origin of species which describes the process of evolution. Now this book set off a firestorm of controversy because religious people claimed that the theory of evolution denied the existence of the Christian God. So people began to see the matter as either or. Either you believe in Christianity or you believe in science. Emily's short poem suggests that faith works well for people who belong to that church and it's a wonderful thing for people who believe. But she seems to be suggesting to those people, why take your chances? Why not adhere to your faith and believe in science when it can help you? I mean, if you're suffering from appendicitis, best to go to a doctor rather than a minister. Or take the poem about the boys dying on the battlefield. Um, success is counted sweetest by those who never succeed. Another poem that I asked you to read uh, for this week. I think the central question in this poem is, what is victory? What does it entail? Most people who went to fight in the Civil War wanted to show how brave and strong they were. And the belief at the time was that combat gave you an opportunity to show what you were really made of. So war was a glorious thing that included camping out and shooting guns. It never really meant death, except maybe a few careless people. That was before the Civil War. Then in the middle of the Civil War, people realized probably best not to be there. Anyway, Emily seems to be saying, the people who know best what victory means are the people who are bleeding out on the battlefield and about to die. And so if you're after victory, is it really worth dying for just to show how brave you are? But then Emily was always the one on the outside. She was the one who had the more considered point of view. Her beliefs didn't always match the common beliefs of her day. She could write her poem, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, from her own experience. In that poem, she seems to be saying that you know, if the people around you believe something that's absolutely stark raving crazy mad, but everybody believes that crazy thing, then you're the dangerous one. If you believe that the thing makes, you're, you're, you're dangerous if you believe the thing that makes sense and isn't crazy. So 
everybody believes something crazy. You're the one sane person. But if you're the one sane person in a house full of crazy, you're actually the crazy one because you go against the consensus. So you can't fight the mob. And if the mob decides on one thing that's foolish and you think it's a bad idea, guess what? You're the nutty one. You're the dangerous one. Then there are the other uh, great short poems. I'm nobody. Who are you? I died for beauty, but was scarce. Apparently, with no surprise, uh, about God and the frost. All good poems. And even when you read them for the first time, you get a sense that Emily's onto something, that she's trying to say something important about our American life. And most of the time, when she's, what she's trying to say to us lies just beyond our reach because her playfulness with the language makes her poetry sometimes very complex and difficult and hard to understand. And so we keep coming back to Dickinson time and again, and each time we encounter one of her poems, they become a little more clear, a little more meaningful than they did the last time. So as you read Dickinson, keep in mind that her poetry is full of strong imagery, and that the things that her poems turn on most often are elaborate symbols. So as you read them, where do you see those symbols? How do you read them? And what do they mean to you?